and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa and this is episode number 13. Today I have one finished object which I am wearing, I have two knitting whips, and I also have a, an update on my quilt to show you. My finished object for today is the Beneath Waves Vest by Johanna Cunyon. This is a test knit that I've talked about in the last couple of episodes. I have been using the Blackberry Ridge medium weight wool in the dark bronze colorway, which is fabulous. And I'll put some footage in here of me wearing this with a couple different outfits. I have never intentionally made a vest pattern before, and so I'm still trying a little bit to figure out how to wear this and how to get comfortable. In this... <laughs> This camera angle makes it look extremely broad across the shoulders. I do feel, I mean, I have broad shoulders anyway. I might not necessarily need to be emphasizing that, but I think it might also just be that I, I don't usually wear vests and I'm not used to seeing myself in this with these sorts of proportions. I think I like it. I think it's growing on me, but I do want to keep trying maybe some other slightly different cuts of vests. One thing that I think might be a little bit better look on me is if I had a little bit of a, if it was a little bit less broad across the shoulders, if the underarm decreases went a little bit further in, closer to uh, sort of where a set-in sleeve would be, might be a little bit better look on me just proportionally. I've talked about the pattern a few times in the past. As I said, it's a test knit that I've been doing, but my understanding is that the pattern is actually going to be released on April 6th, so that's coming up. I will put Johanna's information down below, like her Instagram, in case you want to follow her and know exactly when it was released in case you want to get the pattern yourself. I do have some other plans for some vests in the future, uh, some in the near future, so we'll be trying this again. I think I will definitely wear this. I just want to keep experimenting with the style. Just a couple of the finishing touches. I think last time I showed this to you, I had the body done and I just needed to do the neck and the armhole ribbing. And so she suggests either a tubular bind off or a sewn bind off. And I have seen people sort of use these terms interchangeably for me, a tubular bind off is the one that has a couple of setup rows where you do the knit every other stitch and slip the, every other one, those type of setup rows. And the sewn bind off is the one where you just stop knitting and then you just do your sewn, sewn bind off without those setup rows. That is what I did for the armholes, which are one by one rib. I just stopped knitting the rib. I didn't do any sort of tubular style setup rows. I just went and, and did a regular sewn bind off. And here is what that looks like. You can see it is a nice clean edge if you are careful with your tension as you're pulling the yarn through. It can be a little bit tricky to do a sewn bind off when you're using a, a woolen spun yarn. If your stitches that you're pulling the long tail of yarn through are very tight, it can have a tendency to really like wear on that long yarn as it's being pulled through and, and it can break and you definitely don't want that. So you have to be a little bit careful with it. The neckline is a little bit of a different story because this is a two by two rib, whereas here we had one by one. And so on a two by two rib, you, in order to do that sewn bind off, you have to first rearrange your stitches so that it looks like it's a one by one and then you do your sewn bind off. When I did that, I just went and I rearranged the stitches. Like I just did a round where I wasn't actually working the stitches. I just rearranged them so they were in a correct knit one, purl one order. And then I started my sewn bind off and you guys, it looked like trash, like it was absolutely terrible. I decided at that point to go around with my stitches in that same orientation on the needle, the knit one, purl one, and just do a knit one, purl one row, just so that it would give me a little bit more wiggle room to get that long tail of yarn through for the sewn bind off. And then that is what I ended up doing. So you can see what that sewn bind off looks like on a two by two rib. It's, I don't know you guys, like I, I like the tubular cast on and bind off sometimes, but it bothers me that all of the columns sort of end up slanting in one direction. And I don't, I haven't really seen a way to counteract that. Like it's not something that will bother me in the future. It's only bothering me because I just finished this and I am thinking about it, you know, and I'm here describing it in detail to y'all. So 
We'll see how I feel about it in the future. Maybe doing those setup rows would have helped there. I don't know why I was just really feeling like I didn't want to do them and I just wanted to go for the sewn bind off in this instance. I also really like the color, especially with like a, a denim. I can see this getting a lot of wear with colors that I normally wear. So uh, overall, I'm pretty happy with this. I think I forgot to mention the size that I made. I did the size small, which is the second size. And I think it was around a 38 inch bust. My actual bust is a 35. So just to give you a perspective on how much ease I'm wearing this with. My first work in progress for this week is my Vare sweater by Gudrun Johnston. You all know by now, this is the one on the cover of the Shetland Trader book that came out last year. The last time we talked was when I steeked the armhole openings and did the initial try on of this. And I was going to, at that point, then pick up and start doing the first sleeve. So you can see that it is a set in sleeve and so but it's worked from the top down which is sort of nice in the beginning of this book gudrun talks about how she used the elizabeth doherty top down sweater book that i'm always talking about to sort of finesse the shaping of these sleeves and i absolutely love sleeves that are done in this way so let me show it to you in detail so here's where i am so far i haven't gotten a whole lot done because as soon as i finished the sleeve cap i had sort of a, a decision to make that ended up taking me a little while but to show you the sleeve shaping, the way these Elizabeth Doherty style sleeves are done is you pick up stitches around your sleeve opening. There's a ratio that's described very in detail in her book, but Gudrun just writes the numbers out, um, uh, you know, for each size in, in her Shetland Trader book. But you do some, you form the sleeve cap with short rows. And so you're doing a certain pickup ratio at the top of the sleeve. And then down the side, there's a different ratio. And then down here at the bottom of the sleeve, there's a different pickup ratio. And so because you pick up the stitches for your sleeve using that ratio from the start, you don't really have to think all that much when you are doing the short rows because you get to the point where it's like, oh, I just go and I do the next one and I go and I do the very next stitch, very next stitch, you know, it's that sort of thing. And you do wrap and turn short rows and you don't pick up the wraps. And that seems like sacrilege to many, <laughs> but what it does is that it creates this very nice sort of tailored looking line here because you're not picking up those wraps and it's just lovely. It looks so nice. I haven't done one of these in a while and I just love how they look and fit. They just really fit my arm in particular well and I'm assuming a lot of other people because they're so popular. So I had gotten to this point to the end of the sleeve cap and I had stopped to sort of work on, I think I was working on one of my other projects which I'm about to show you too. And I, at this point, had seen that Jackie from Caddy Jack's Knits had stopped on hers and made hers like a t-shirt length. And I was like, oh, that looks really cute. <laughs> I was like, maybe I'll do mine that way too. And so I had to think about it for maybe a week. Like I was really working hard on this other project, so it's not like I didn't have anything to do. I eventually decided I did need to put full length sleeves on this mainly because the type of yarn that I'm using is very wooly wool. It's not something that I would ever be in a situation where I would need a t-shirt and want to be wearing wool that's this like, it's not scratchy, but it's, it's hardy. It's a winter, it's a winter sweater, you know? If I had been using a smooth yarn, like I think she used the La Bien Aimé, which is no doubt very nice and smooth. And um, something like that would be perfect for a t-shirt version of this. But with this yarn, I could just not, I wouldn't wear it if it was a t-shirt, you know, it's definitely gonna be a cold weather garment for me. So I did decide to go on with the sleeves. And here I had to stop and have another think because as you know, if you've been here in past episodes, my arms are very short and I'm always having to figure out how to adjust sleeve lengths. And most of the time, if you have a straight sleeve, that's not a big deal. Usually what I will do because I also have muscular arms is I won't really make any adjustments to the, the sleeve shaping. If it's a straight sleeve, I'll just stop early and then either, you know, decrease to what I need to have a tight cuff or I'll have just like a little bit of a, a looser sleeve and I like that look anyway. I talked a little bit on my Marie Wallen Oak project about how I had to shorten the sleeves for an all over color work sleeve, which took a little bit of thinking. And this one I'm also not going to be able to just cut 
length off the end because of the style of sleeve it is. I'm doing the balloon sleeve on this project, which is the same one that's on the cover here. You can tell there's just a ton of volume down here. And then there's a good long cuff. Like this is probably half of the length of her forearm in this photo, I would say. And so I knew that I was gonna have to make adjustments somewhere else in addition to at the end, because if I were to just cut that length off of the end, I would end up with a way too short cuff here. You know, if it, if it was like looking like that, that's not quite the same look. You know what I mean? Then I was like, okay, how am I gonna do this? And it helped me a little bit to look at the schematic and the measurements. I know that for my arms, a good full length, like really long sleeve on me to get down to really cover my wrist is about 17 and a half inches, 17, 17 and a half, which is pretty short. That is for a set in sleeve design where I know that the top of that, where I'm taking that measurement from is right up against my armpit. If it's like a drop shoulder or a, you know, a raglan or something that's a little bit looser, I might need a shorter sleeve in that instance. But for something where that, that underarm is right up against my armpit, 17 and a half inches tends to be what I need to do for my sleeve length. When I came to the schematic to see how long the balloon sleeves are, it says 22 and a half inches. And I was like, I don't quite know how to interpret that because that is quite long. And it makes me think that there is something going on with the volume at the bottom of that sleeve that's sort of making, like you need to have the sleeve be a little bit longer so that that cuff at the end of the sleeve will sort of allow that balloon sleeve to poof over it. Uh, because that is quite, quite, quite long, <laughs> right? 22 and a half inches for this one. And so I was like, how in the heck do I even figure out how long I need this to be then? Because I know I need to shorten it to something less than that, but I don't exactly know how much. So then I took a look at the measurement for, there is a straight sleeve option, thankfully. And the straight sleeve in this design is designed for a 19 and a half inch length. So I reasoned that if the straight version is designed for 19 and a half inch length sleeves and I need 17 and a half, for a normal straight sleeve. The difference there is two inches. So theoretically, if I shorten the balloon sleeve by two inches somewhere, it should fit me in the way that it's supposed to fit proportionally. Does that make sense? As far as thinking about where to shorten it. So we've discussed this. If I were to take the length off there, that would be too short of a cuff for the, the style. And so what I have decided to do, you start your sleeve and you're, you knit a certain number of rows here just straight. And then you start your shaping for the balloon sleeve. And so what I am gonna do is take one inch off of the cuff and one inch off of this section up here so that my balloon sleeve shaping will still be the same and as written and should occur hopefully in the right place. I think that this will work, but we'll see if it doesn't. I mean, you guys will know. The other thing that I considered was just knitting this sleeve as is with the the full number of recommended rows up here and then just i would end up with a smaller balloon sleeve because i would need to start the cuff earlier but if i'm going for a full balloon sleeve i really want to go for it and so that is why i have decided to take one inch from here and one inch from here i've done a couple of the increase rounds for the balloon sleeve already which i am marking just to keep track of them with my stitch markers and the shaping of this I really like. You actually increase at the top of the round, so at the top of the arm and at the underarm, and that's where your increases happen. Like it's written in a very similar way to a, a normal straight sleeve where you have your increases down the underarm, but this just happens to also have them on the top of the arm. And so each round you're doing, you're increasing four stitches instead of just two, like you normally would for a straight sleeve. And that's what helps create that balloon effect. She has you doing make one left and make one right. So I'm showing you the underside of the arm now. And they're quite invisible, especially in this yarn. I'm using a nice woolen spun yarn from Green Mountain Spinnery. This is the Lana base. And it really hides those increases very well. I like how these increases are happening in a very organic way, particularly since this is also going to be the look of the increases on the top of the arm. You know, if you're using a more obvious increase like a knit front back or something like that, you would be able to see it very clearly on the outside of the arm. 
but this way it's just gonna look really nice and smooth. So that is my Vare. I am hoping to have the whole thing done by the next time I talk to you. I don't know if it will happen because these sleeves are gonna be a lot of fabric, but the way sleeves tend to go for me is that I usually have to do some amount of thinking about how I'm gonna shorten them and that slows me up and then once I've made that decision I can just sort of power through them. So we'll see if I'm able to do that with these balloon sleeves as well. The next work in progress I have to talk to you about is the Marie Wallen Fair Isle Club project. This is the Killeen cardigan that I started talking about last week and I have finished the second section now which is the vast majority of the body actually. It's this big piece on the back is now done and attached to this so it goes all the way down about halfway down the arm and is the large part of the back and also the front. This project is pretty unwieldy to like hold up and try to explain so I actually filmed a separate segment about this project which I'm going to insert here now. Here is my Colleen cardigan. So here was the section that I showed you in the last podcast just up until here and then here is everything I have done since then. So this is the vast majority of the body and I am going to be dealing with my steaks now because I, according to the pattern, need to cut the steaks now. And so in order to prepare this, because I can't block it, it is a, in a weird shape right now with the steaks still being uncut, I'm going to need to cut them before I would be able to block this for real. And I don't particularly want to cut the steaks without reinforcing them in some way because I'm not able to block it first. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to press this section up here with a steam cloth and with my iron right here. And then I'm going to use my machine to machine sew a couple of lines of stitching up here so that I can cut and not worry about it. This British Breeds yarn I have used before in my last Marie Wallen project and I was able to cut through that without reinforcing it at the time with no problem. The difference between this time and the past time is that in the past I was able to wet block it first and I felt like that really helped the fibers grip each other a little bit more securely. This because I'm just going to be cutting without having blocked it and then there's going to be additional manipulation of the stitches along the edges of this steak when I'm doing the subsequent sections of this project. I just want to make sure that I have that little bit of additional security with the machine reinforcement. I'm mainly just pressing in the area of the steak here and I'm not bringing the iron all the way up to where I have my interchangeable cord because I not sure how that would hold up under intense heat, but I just want to get that area of the steak to lie down relatively flat before I sew my line of machine stitching there. I have just pressed now in the area of the steaks where I'm going to sew with my machine. So we have this steak at the bottom, then we have another steak right here. These are both for the center front. And then we have two steaks for the armholes, which are relatively short at this point because there's going to be additional fabric for the upper arm added at the top. And right now I'm just going to go and sew two lines of machine stitching and then cut these steaks. Okay, so we are ready to go. I'm using some pink thread here so you have hopefully a shot at seeing what I'm doing here. And I'm just going to go and sew some lines for my steaks now. I'm using a zigzag for this that is not very wide and it's like the full normal length of the zigzag stitch on my machine which is four millimeters. Just to try to keep things organized here I think I might actually tape these tails over to the side just so that they don't get caught underneath like in the feed dogs or anything and so they're not going over to various sides and getting caught across the steak. All right we're back at the ironing board again so take two. I'm going to push all the tails over to one side and Tape them. And so when I'm sewing on the right side of this, I want to sew basically in this area right here to the left of the tails here, but it's going to be the right side of the steak. So let's see if that worked and then I'll tape the tails the other side, sew the other side of the steak and then cut it. Alright, so here you can see on the back side my first line of stitching here. If I flip these tails over, I've got my second line of stitching here, and I'm just going to cut right in between them. Okay, so the first steak is cut. It seems relatively secure. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing for the other steaks, and then I will catch you back 
on the other side. Now we're going to my kitchen table so that I can actually show this thing to you because it's sort of too big to hold up. So here you can see the basic shape of the body of this garment, which is really interesting. Now that the steaks have been cut, you can clearly see sort of the layout of this whole thing and what is going to happen next. When we're looking at the original pattern, you can see that there are a couple of vertical panels here which haven't been added on yet, and then there's also one that's sort of inset in here. And if we look closely, this is the one that I'm talking about. And it's added on to section B, which I just completed, but it also is attached to the very first section on this edge. And as we're looking at this now, you can see exactly where that's going to go. I think that the next set of instructions will have me pick up stitches along here and then knit that in the flat towards the center of the garment on both sides and then somehow attach it down here. I think, I haven't read too far ahead, but I'm pretty sure that's what's coming up next. You might remember from the last episode that the construction of this first band here is relatively simple, just like most other colorwork sweaters that are started from the bottom up. It was just in the round, you read the chart from right to left, so you're always looking at the right side of the garment, and you are always reading the chart from right to left per normal. The way that this section is written up here is different. This section that I just completed was also knit in the round and closed here at the front with this steak. You can clearly see now that it's been cut that this section had less width at the front because we didn't have this section here that's waiting for the inset piece to be sewn in. And this section also had the increases for these dolman sleeves, which I have never done before and I'm finding this construction very interesting. Again, this entire section was knit in the round, and then when you got to these points on either side of the body, so on either side of the front and the back, you would start doing some increases. And you would do increase for the front and also an increase on the back side to create this sloping shape. So at first you would only be doing one increase on the front and then one increase on the back. So you were doing two increases right next to each other with no stitches in between and continuing in the color work pattern. And then at this point, I think it's around here, looks like it visually anyway, you would start doing two, a double increase. So you would increase two stitches on the front and two stitches on the back. And so you would have four increase stitches right next to each other on the needle and it started to get extremely uncomfortable like physically uncomfortable to do i was choosing to do a knit for the single increases i was doing a knit front back and then for the double increases i was doing a knit front back front so at this increase point right here which sort of looks like a seam but is actually just where i was doing these increases i would end up with a knit front back front knit front back front right next to each other and it was just like a lot of stitches jammed together in here and it was it was really uncomfortable i could not wait to get to this point where i was knitting just in the round again with these steaks added for the bottom of the armholes the schematic illustrates this pretty well so here is the first section i did and then here is the section i just did so you can see here's this inset panel that's coming next i think uh, these are the panels down the front of the garment and then here there is a little bit of a lower sleeve that gets added on and then there's another strip going across the top of the arm. I've had some questions about how I would describe the clarity of this pattern and how it's written and I would say if you are somebody who gets irritated by sort of old school patterns like Marie Wallen worked for Rowan for a long time so a lot of the way the pattern is written is sort of similar to that older style and if you don't like being asked to do a little bit of mental gymnastics this might not be for you. And the reason I'm saying that at this point is because the way that this top section here is charted, the section I've just completed, is you only have the chart for this one section, for the right front of the cardigan. So the chart for this entire top section is actually just shaped like this right front. So you have the center, front, vertical, you have the bottom and then you have your increases which are going to the left on the chart. So you see the chart continuing along these increases and then you get to this point where you add the steak and then continue knitting up. So at that point you're reading the chart from right to left. Then when you get onto the back, you're expected to mirror the chart and you start reading it in reverse. So even though you're looking at the right side of the fabric still because you're knitting in the round, 
you are actually reading the chart from this point at the outer edge of the sleeve to the center back. Between those two points, you're reading the chart from left to right, almost as if you were knitting on the wrong side, but you're not. Then when you get to your center back stitch, which you are supposed to clearly mark, I put mine just between two orange markers here. Once you get to that point on the back, then you reverse the chart again and you start reading it from right to left until you get to the outer edge of your other sleeve and then when you turn the garment over again and you are back on your left front of your cardigan, you reverse the chart one more time. So that's the way it's written and it actually is a very simple way to write it and it's, it's actually simpler for the knitter to read it once you get your mind around that sort of spatial awareness of like what am I looking at right now exactly. One thing that makes it easier to do, like that sounds, I, I get in my explaining that, that that sounds like a crazy thing to do, but the thing that makes this not such a daunting task is that these motifs in this section are actually very symmetrical across the center line of each motif. So I think it's about an 18 stitch pattern repeat, which is not very big and easy enough to memorize, certainly, and you can very clearly see whether things are stacking up correctly. So it's not as bad as you would think, um, but I know that not everybody is down for that sort of spatial awareness type pattern writing. So that's just something to note about this. One thing that's nice about this club is that you're not alone when it comes to trying to interpret the pattern and that sort of thing. So she will release an email that goes out to everybody who's in the club at the beginning of each section. And it will have a couple of videos that you can watch that will explain parts that are maybe a little tricky or maybe could use some visuals to explain a little bit better than just what's in the pattern. And I've been finding those very helpful. I've definitely been watching those. The other thing that she's been doing is that there is a Facebook group associated with this club and I'm not a part of it because I can't be bothered with Facebook. Uh, but I understand that a lot of people are in there and there are there's a lot of questions and, and that sort of thing that get answered in that group. And then she will also do a Q and A session with people live and it gets recorded and then it gets sent out to everybody via email. So I've been getting the video of the Q and A session as well, which is nice. I find the pattern to be clearly written enough. It's just a little with the weird construction. It's nice to have those videos just to sort of reinforce what you think you're supposed to be doing. I would think that this would be very difficult if you were a very new color work knitter. If you have done a couple color work sweaters before, I think that the the pacing of this and the the difficulty would be fine if you're an adventurous sort of spatially aware person when it comes to like how do all these parts fit together, but I probably wouldn't recommend this for a very new color work beginner. She has said that there are beginners who will who will do it every year and I really applaud those people because this one is pretty complex. It's definitely doable. I think I'm having a lot of fun with it because I'm very confident when it comes to this sort of thing and if you're an adventurous type that I think is the the type of knitter who's going to enjoy this sort of thing. So that is how far I have gotten on my Marie Wallen Fair Isle Club and I will just continue to keep you guys updated as the new sections come out. My last work in progress that I want to talk about today is my quilt which I was recently inspired to start working on again by Miga of the Skeins of Dreams podcast. She is running a blanket make-along so knitting, crocheting, quilting, whatever. And I started this quilt maybe six months ago and I had gotten work done on it here and there. I tend to have like periods of time where I really want to hand sew and then longer periods of time where I don't or it's not what I particularly want to do so I stop working on it. And I have about half of the amount of blocks that I had originally planned to have for this quilt and I think I'm going to lay them out today and show you because I haven't done that yet. This quilt is a pretty traditional style so it is a version of the tumbling blocks traditional quilt pattern and I saw this particular arrangement of colors in this book by Ginny Beyer. So quilt making by hand. I purchased this copy used. It is an excellent book if you are into quilting or if you're looking to get into it. And when I first bought this book, I was very intimidated by it because it seemed like the quilts are so big and beautiful and all completely handmade and I was intimidated, but now 
I just appreciate it. Like it's a beautiful thing to just look through. Yeah, so she calls this one boxed blocks and tumbling blocks usually looks just like a bunch of cubes stacked on top of each other. Well, let me see if there's a picture of something like that in here. So here she's showing how to put how to put it together, but usually the entire quilt will look like this. And the reason that this looks different than the one that I'm gonna show you that I'm making is because of the arrangement of colors. So you can see in a traditional tumbling blocks, you will have the light color be in sort of the same position always within the, the individual block motif. And it sort of tricks the eye into seeing these as 3D blocks stacked on top of each other. So this quilt is actually put together in a very similar way. Uh, we have the the cubes that are made out of sort of three by three blocks, which I'll show you in a second. But because of the arrangement where you put that lightest color in the blocks, the little individual blocks themselves, ends up when you put them together making these star, star motifs. It appears to be a star quilt, but it's actually a tumbling blocks quilt. She says in the text about this that this was actually a scrap quilt, so there are just many, many, many colors in here. And then she put one of her, her beautiful border prints on here as well, which you can hopefully see a little detail. And I am nowhere near choosing a border print, but I was thinking that together we might lay out my, my blocks and see how much I have. It says the finished size is 83 and a half inches by 97 and a half. So that is large, that's large. Uh, and I originally was planning to make sort of just this quilt like I didn't use the template from the book because they are just all 60 degree diamond pieces which look like this and so I cut these out just using one of my rulers I think these are two and a half inch on each side so it's slightly a different size than her templates which is probably going to cause me some geometry grief when i get to cutting out the blocks that will fill in along the sides i didn't really think about that uh, until it was too late but i am not entirely sure that i want a quilt quite that large i might want something that's more like 60 inches by 72 or something like that that i can have on the couch and so i would like to lay out my pieces now and see what it's looking like size wise so let's go do that All right, here is what we have so far. It is pretty big. I don't think I want a quilt to be twice as this big, and also not to mention it will take me forever to hand quilt it. So I might just do another couple of blocks. Uh, I really need to look at the pattern again and figure out how this is supposed to be filled in to actually make the sides square, and that will help determine how many more blocks that I need. But I... I think this is really pretty. I wanted the palette of this whole thing to be mostly neutrals with some greens and browns and then black, gray, white, all the neutrals. And I do have some that are sort of pops of color like you can see right here with this floral print, which is sort of nice. I have a couple metallic prints in here which are a little bit more modern looking. And then I have a lot of like really traditional quilt fabric patterns in here too. I, I'm really a big fan of the traditional looking quilts just because that's what I was raised with. And so I am, um, that just looks like what a quilt is supposed to look like to me, you know? Yeah, you can really see how the arrangement of the colors will trick the eye, you know? If I look at an individual block, you wouldn't think that putting this together with a whole bunch of other blocks just like it would make something that looks like a star quilt, you know? But because of where those very light colored diamonds are located. That is what does this when it's put together in this way. So there we go. I feel like this is probably about five feet by four feet right now. Maybe a little over four feet wide. So I might keep going for a little bit, but we will see. I'll probably make a decision when I'm editing this video <laughs> how much further I want to go. It will definitely re-energize me to keep working on it if I know that I'm close to the end of piecing the top. So that is going to be my entry for the Blankets of Dreams Mal. So thank you, Miga, for the uh, the inspiration to drag this back out and, and keep going on it, because I know that I will really enjoy 
the finished blanket. I only have a couple of minutes left before I have to run out the door and I would like to talk about some upcoming projects. I had mentioned in the last episode that I want to make a Eula jacket, but I want to make it into a vest. So this is a pattern, I cannot remember the designer, but I will put it on the screen. And it is one of those patterns where you hold, I think it's a worsted weight yarn together with a mohair. And so my mind immediately flashed to this worsted weight yarn that I have in my stash, which is Barocco Lanas. I cannot tell, I have bright sun in here right now and that looks pretty accurate. It's like a nice sage green. And I have four skeins of this that I had originally bought to make the Sari Norland, I think it's Muru pullover. I had swatched for it and I showed you guys a swatch and it did not look good. Like the colors that I picked to go together didn't look good. And so I was stuck with this like weird amount of this main color, it was supposed to be the main color for that sweater. And I was like, ah, oh, what am I gonna do with that? And it was sort of bothering me that it was in my stash and it was a weird amount and I didn't have a plan for it. And so when I got this notion to make a vest version of this Eula sweater, I decided this would be perfect. And I thought that I had mohair that would go with it in my stash, which was this Isagir silk mohair. And it is a perfect match. I mean, it's an exact color match, but I don't have enough of this. I'm already gonna be cutting it close with the amount that I have in my stash of this. And this, I don't have nearly enough. So instead of being stressed about the amount of mohair not being enough because I cannot get more of that in the same dye lot and I just sort of don't want to be bothered with trying to mix and match the dye lots and all of that. I ended up going for a slightly darker mohair. This is the Pearl Soho Tussock, uh, their silk mohair. And from the feeling and the content of this, I suspect that this is made at the same place as the Shibui mohair. It feels very similar to Shibui but it is less expensive. So if you're looking for something that's a little bit higher quality than the, the very standard mohairs that are out there that you see all the time, but you're not ready to drop the money in the Shibui, which I completely understand, this is priced somewhere in the middle. And so I liked the idea of this. I started looking for a very specific green to go with this because I like this pairing of a slightly darker mohair with the lighter base yarn for a pattern that has texture is really gonna make that those textured stitches and those cables pop. And so that is why I ended up going for this slightly darker, but still within the same color family, uh, color for the mohair. So that I'm hoping to swatch for. I said I was gonna bring the swatch this time and I just haven't gotten to it. So I'm sorry about that, but I will hopefully have that for the near future. My other upcoming project is going to be a summer top and I'm still going back and forth on which pattern I want to use, but I have the yarn and it is the Rowan Cotton Cashmere, which I have never used before. As you can tell, I'm about to be in a, a sage green period in my life, apparently. The yarn feels very interesting. I would say it feels more like cotton. I can't tell what the content is because it's covered up by this sticker, uh, but I will put it, I'll put it down below. It feels very much like a cotton yarn, but it's just soft. It almost has a little bit of a pebbly texture, which I find to be interesting. And so this is what I will be using for my upcoming summer top, whatever that is. I will definitely be swatching for that before the next time we talk. I will have more info for you then, but those are my two sort of upcoming plans. I'm sorry if this has felt a little bit rushed. I have been I'm in between things and today is a very busy day, but I definitely wanted to make sure that I could record and show you my progress so far on all of these projects before I get too far ahead and then it's too hard to explain and you know how it is. I still tried to hit all of the important talking points about these projects, so I hope that you found this still informative and interesting, if a bit faster than usual. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.